This is happening. It, it's a, the uh, this thing comes and goes. Um, I, I can't quite. Uh, um, it's not a clear, uh, uh, undisturbed transmission. Sir, no, not to be clear, sir. I've, I've started it, sir. See what I mean? I can hear you, sir. Jehan, my dear friends, today I'm really right. honored and I have the privilege, the proud privilege of being in conversation with a very, very illustrious personality who needs no introduction. You all know him. You all know of the family he comes from. You all know of his illustrious background, his career. Unblished career in the Air Force. We are talking to Air Marshal Casey Karyappa. And uh, there is a lot, there's a lot we are going to be discussing on. Let me tell you all a small incident where on 22nd September 1965, the last day of the India Pakistan war, Air Marshal Karyappa was a young officer in the Air Force. He was flying the Hunter aircraft. And Hunter aircraft had the handicap of not being, not having the ability to fly at night. But again, it was the Hunter aircraft also in 1971, which helped our Punjab regiment. And we won the, the, the war in 1971. In 1975, in 1965, Air Marshal Karyappa as a young officer was taken as a prisoner of war with Pakistan. And he was offered by the president of Pakistan General Ayub Khan was the president of Pakistan and the and General Musa was the chief at that time. When they recognized Air Marshal Karyappa, they immediately, the, the Pakistan president sent the High Commissioner of Pakistan to, uh, who was in Delhi to meet the Field Marshal who was the Air Marshal's father and offered for his release. And the Field Marshal said, all Indians over there who are prisoners of war are my sons. Look after them well. And that was the, we are in going to be in conversation with a very, very illustrious personality answer. Firstly, thank you for taking your time. I'm very interested and very intrigued to know you being a senior officer, son, how come you did not join the army, but the air force, sir? Well, well the answer to that really is quite simple. Uh, first of all, uh, to, you know, get the record straight. I had originally, as a brat, wanted to join, be a naval aviator. But because my um, mathematics was so abysmal, uh, it was either a question of joining the Army or the Air Force. The Air Force would, would then be the ob obvious, it had to be anything but the Army, because I would then find it very difficult to live up to the standards and expectations of others and standards set by my father. And if I did something which warranted a kick in the pants and I didn't get it, they'd say, oh, he's General Karyapa's son. If I did get it, they'd say, good God, General Karyapa's son doing this. And on the other hand, if I got a pat on the back, it was exactly the same thing. He got a pat on the back because he's his father's son. So it was really a no-brainer when it came to deciding and to joining the Air Force. And in the Air Force, the great thing is this, though I may have been known as my father's son, anything that I did or achieved or didn't do was a reflection only on me and not on my parentage. And uh, I was lucky, I was fortunate, I was blessed. And uh, in, the, in the years, I don't think I really uh, let the side down. And I lived up to the expectations of those who knew me as my father's son without attributing to the fact that Anything that I did was because I was his son. That's so it. I can I can so relate to this. You know, I read a theory when I was in school, and I was in a boarding school, sir, not very far from Kurg, incidentally, at Lawrence School, Lovedale, sir. So I read this theory where it said, and oh, scared that, I, 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 heard, I heard the name of that school. I, Major, I'm from a superior Lawrence School in Sanaa. Oh, I, I'm from the Lawrence School, Sanawa. <laughs> I love the way you how you said it, sir. I'm from a. <laughs> I love the way. <laughs> never given, sir. That is why you know our school now, was, never was, given. With all due respects to all Lawrenceans, sir. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. But th this is with all respect due to Lawrence because I think. I think anyone from, from any Lawrence school were really the top of the pops. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Wow, sir. Brilliant. So happy to hear that. Sir, 
So I read this theory in school where it said, and give examples, you know, where sons of very senior or very successful fathers, they turn out to be very mediocre, apparently. That's what the theory said. And mm-hmm. that scared the daylight out of me. So you will be happy to know, I recently took your example in a TEDx talk in Uti at the Good Shepherd International School. I said, you did, yeah, what did you I'm, do? Sir, I gave your example at a TEDx talk at Good Shepherds International School. I said, here we have the field marshal son who himself rose to become an air marshal. So it is that theory does not stand true. It's not valid. It is a person. It is what a person does. Like, and sir, I can so relate to what you were saying when you joined the academy. Oh, he is general career path son. So anything bad he did or because he's a general son, he's doing this. Anything, anything good you did? Oh, despite being a Absolutely. Gentleman. <laughs> Sir, tell you one thing. The, right. same, the same thing when you became an heir, your children would have uh, probably have faced it, be it in the civil world or be it in fault anywhere. Oh, he is a Major, your, your, transmission, your transmission is very distorted. It's not coming through uh, uh, clearly. So, uh, is it better now? No. It's, uh, now, is it... Try again. Uh, it is a wee bit better, yes. Okay, sir. Sir, would like to know about your experience on 22nd September 1965. That was the last day of the war. When you were conducting air raids, air attacks on the enemy side. And you were shot down, and you were taken, uh, taken, you were taken over as prisoner of war. And when you saw people in the car, you only had a revolver, which you didn't have time to actually take it out. And you saw the khaki-clad people coming into you, coming close to you. And you were not sure whether they were Indians or they were Pakistani. And there was artillery shelling happening at that time. And the men said, "Oh, that is your fire, right, from your country." So we would like to know your experience from there, how it all went, sir. Well, Major, it was uh, to start with, uh, there was no question of reaching for my revolver because when I landed on the ground, I landed on my butt and um, in, in a field. I had ejected at very high speed, very low, and I was sort of felt that I was paralyzed. I couldn't really move. So there's no question of reaching for my revolver. Uh, when I was surrounded by these troops and they said, there were your guns firing at us, then I realized that I was now in Pakistani hands. Uh, they put me onto a stretcher. They asked me the usual questions. Who are you, etc., etc. I said, I am Flight Lieutenant so-and-so, number so-and-so, and that was it. And this is my name. And uh, they put me onto a stretcher and took me to what turned out to be the brigade headquarters that I was uh, attacking by quite by chance. And there again, the same question was asked, I'm presuming, by the brigade commander. From where I was then taken, I was on a stretcher. I was in ex- uh, excruciating pain. Because apart from uh, having, I didn't realize it at the time, but my I had damaged my spine and uh, my left arm. Uh, I was then put onto a stretcher and then sent off to uh, the, uh, I think it was probably the RAP or Rear Hospital in a place called Luliani, which is south of Lahore. And from Luliani, where I was for a while, I then went off to, taken to Lahore, where I was admitted to the military hospital there. Or general hospital, whatever they called it. I was kept in solitary confinement throughout. And during one of those days, um, for the few three or four days that I was there, or five days, I can't remember, General Musa did come and visit. And I don't know whether he visited me because I was a prisoner of war or because I was my uh, my father's son. And because um, at that time I had no idea, no knowledge at all as to that, whether the Indian uh, Air Force or Indian, uh, India knew that I was a prisoner of war. And uh, then he asked me, he said, uh, well, anything we can do for you? I said, I'd like to rejoin the remaining, uh, the other prisoners of war. And um, so a few days later, I was flown from Lahore to Rawalpindi. And where again, I was put in, first of all, in solitary confinement in, in a ward because I was being treated for my spine injury. And then I was sent to a, uh, kept in a prisoner of war cell in solitary confinement. Uh, I don't know where it was, but uh, 
where by day the uh, doors were locked and I was in darkness, and by night uh, the the lights were on, and so you know it, it upset one circadian uh, rhythm, if you know what I'm saying. And um, food was what I would uh, they were g giving the troops of the langar. There was no, uh, if I wanted to use the toilet facilities, I was I'd be blindfolded and take. Hello, Major Shah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I can hear you, sir. There was a bit network. Hello. Hello, Major Shah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Ah, now, now I, I, I see you. you. You had sort of uh, disappeared off the screen for a while. Anyway, so uh, I was uh, um, interrogated by, I think his name, by Major Qureshi, who asked me you know, the usual questions, what, who, where, why, where he would take off from, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I tried to obfuscate and I realized there's no point carrying on like this. And uh, I, he asked me the names of my course mates. I said, there's no big deal. It's more or less in, in the public uh, domain at that time. So the Air Force list was always available to whomsoever. And so I was standing at 10 days in solitary confinement in Rawalpindi, from where I was put into a train um, to, to um, not to make it, Rawalpindi by train, to uh, Dargai. Dargai is a fort in the northwest frontier. Um, kept blindfolded throughout for obvious reasons. And that's where I joined uh, the rest of the, the 56 other prisoners of war. Um, there was the, um, th there were three separate compounds, one for non-Sikh army officers, one for the Sikh, uh, about 10 or 12 Sikh army officers, or four Sikh who were being captured en masse, and a separate compound for seven of us Air Force officers. And we continued like this till uh, we were um, uh, repatriated, we were, till the Air Force was repatriated on the 22nd of January, 1966. In between, I did, uh, again, a, a spell of about a week or 10 days in solitary confinement in uh, Peshawar. I figured it was Peshawar because, uh, again, all movement was bl blindfolded and at night, uh, one could hear the sound of the C-130 uh, heli aircraft that the Pakistan Air Force was known to have. So it was just a question of uh, interpolation uh, and, and thinking that, all right, since the C-130s, it could only be Peshawar. And uh, then went back to the um, main prisoner of camp. Also, who, who was with me in solitary confinement in a separate cell was um, then squadron a money low, uh, a Canberra pilot who was also shot down on the 22nd night, uh, night of 21st, 22nd, and I was shot 22nd morning. And um, anyway, we went back to the prisoner of war camp where we were reunited with the other five uh, Air Force officers. And it was only on the first, the first week of January, uh, December, that we received our first Red Cross parcels. And uh, th that sort of gave one in, uh, awareness that now we were officially recognized as prisoners of war. And uh, whatever um, benefits you can call them that accrued thereof, for example, we were given a princely pay of 60 rupees a month. And uh, with that, we had to be paid for our razai. We paid for any, if we wanted some firewood or any uh, and toiletries, it had to come out of that. And uh, essentially, that was it. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, that, that was what um, uh, being a prisoner was all about. Sir, one small thing, you know, I I don't know, though, of course, uh, wrong question to ask you, you were yourself a prisoner of war, but the whole logic of blindfolding and being used to and uh, using the toilet facilities did not make sense. I mean, how, what sense would that make, sir, from your cell to... I, uh, have, no, I have no idea, but I suppose... It, 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 it's something which goes on around the world. Wherever you see 
prisoners of war, uh, whether it was Vietnam, whether it was Korea, whether, when a prisoner of war was taken and, uh, and an individual would move from place to place, he, uh, the individuals were always blindfolded, probably so that if at some point in time, if you got aware of where you were, you could possibly think in terms of escape, let us say. So if, if you had your bearings, then you could think of uh, in terms of escape. It is like, why was I kept, my room kept in bright light at night and in total darkness by day so that I couldn't see what was happening outside. And I just presumed that uh, uh, throughout that I, I was in the Rawalpindi um, military hospital from Lahore to Rawalpindi. I presumed that from Rawalpindi went to Attock, uh, from where uh, by train, again blindfolded, and from there by uh, by road to the um, to the main prisoner of war camp at that guy. So, so I, I also that if you're not essentially, I think really to keep you guessing, and and you know the as a prisoner, the, the worst that can happen to you is the fear of the unknown. You don't know what is going to happen to you till such time. And then suddenly, when you're amongst your own, you've got a surge of adrenaline and you're confident again to say, oh, God's in his heaven and, and all is well. Sir, sir. Sir, coming back to sir, how many days in total did you uh, spend across uh, on, the, on the other side, sir? Oh, very much, very little. Uh, uh, virtually exactly four months to the hour almost. So four months, I mean, that's very uh, magnanimous of you to say very little, but actually four months is when we want no, to come actually, to No, actually, look at what others have been through. You take prisoners of war from the Second World War, you take the Korean War, you take the Vietnam War. Now you take the case of um, John McCain, who was a, you know, a member of uh, Senate, uh, Senator. He spent seven years, right? He was a Navy pilot. His father was commanding the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii at the time that John McCain was shot down. And uh, he didn't get any special treatment. And uh, so what is four months when you look at seven years? Uh, a drop in the ocean. Very true, sir. So then that way, we have even heard of this Japanese soldier who was told by his commanding officer that you will not surrender. And he fought the, the war for decades. Even the, when the war ended, the Japanese soldier thought that the war is still on. Yes. And, and they had to trace out his commanding officer mm -hmm. who had become old and retired, who had come, who had to come and tell him to stand down now. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I think I remember hearing about, about that uh, particular, uh, particular case. <clears throat> yes, sir, sir. Sir, so, so tell me a bit about, so people know about the time when you were a prisoner of war and so tell me a bit about your academy days and about your bonding with your course mates and how was it as a youngster and how was the treatment that was given to you from your course mates, from your instructors in academy, sir? Because of course, that everyone knew, it was no secret that you were a very illustrious senior officer, son. But of course, you had your own identity as well and you were passing your test, you, as you said, until you joined the Air Force. You had your own identity. And when one, because one can't grow under the shadows of a banyan tree, one has to have the sunlight, face, have water, wither dust storms, which you did. You did all that. So, and you rose up to the rank of an air marshal, which is commendable, sir. So, would like to know a bit about your academy days, sir. Well, to start with, uh, we, we both, both you and I come from the same school, Lawrence School. You were, of course, in Lovedale. I was in Sanaa. Uh, and uh, we, I think we share the same motto of never give in. I don't know if that is your motto also. But um, uh, there's always been that bond, that affinity that existed between uh, Lovedale and Sanaa. I left Sanaa in, in 1954 to join the JSW in Derridun. Um, we were there for six months, uh, less than six months. And then uh, the, uh, the JSW became the NDA when it shifted to Karakwasla. So after one term in Derudun, I spent three terms in Karakwasla, uh, in what was then known as Fox Gordon, from where uh, we uh, I passed out on the 26th of May, 1956, in a period of just under two years from the time that I joined the JSW. Um, <clears throat> my father, <clears throat> excuse me, I was posted then to the, um, after finishing with the NDA, went and joined the Air Force Flying College in uh, Begumpet, in Hyderabad. 
where we did a, a short stint flying the HT2. And then the flying college shifted from Begumpet to Jodhpur, from where I was commissioned in on the 29th of May, 1957. And my father did the honors. He was invited by the then air chief, uh, uh, Marshal uh, Mukherjee, to be the uh, presiding of uh, the uh, uh, the, the presiding officer over the passing out parade. And he presented my wings. Uh, and thereafter, I, I joined the Air Force. Um, initially, went to uh, Hakimpet, to uh, Warangal in, um, in Hyderabad, then to Hakimpet. Uh, and, but I was commissioned on the 29th of May, 1957. And then I flew fighters in, in Pune, uh, converted onto the Hunter. I became an instructor uh, and was instructing in Allahabad at the time of the 1965 war, when we were called up to join our respective squadrons to beef up strength. And uh, having flown out of Hindon um, uh, on the 22nd of September, I was shot, shot down flying out of Halwara. I flew went from Hindon to Halwara on the 10th of September, 1965. And uh, 22nd, I was shot down. So, wasn't there any pressure on you in academy that to opt for the army, not for the air force at Kalakmasa? Like you know, I well, I won't say pressure, but my father was then in Australia, and um, I was a cadet in the NDA. All it so happened that the army commander uh, in Southern Command was General Thimaya, who is uh, with the same clan, and uh, sort of relationship-wise, his grandfather and my grandfather were stepbrothers or first or something like that, but we were related. So when it came to the third term and I had the privilege or the option of changing from army to the Air Force, I did so. And uh, that sort of stirred up a hornet's nest and General Habibullah, God bless him, uh, was in, uh, in a flat spin because he said, Here, here's uh, General Karyapa's son who wants to join the Air Force. So he sent off a message to my father and um, I think father then communicated to General Timaya to say, look, try and talk some sense into my son's head. And I think General Timaya then says, look, he's a young man. Let him decide what he wants to do. And father very graciously accepted that. And eventually when I was uh, commissioned and he, as I, as I said, he, uh, he uh, uh, pinned my wings onto my chest when he was asked by that great journalist and uh, group captain Balik, who used to be uh, Air Force PRO, uh, what, I forget his first name, um, but he, he was really a legend as far as the armed forces. Can, and he said, uh, what was your reaction, uh, asking him, what was your reaction when your son joined the Air Force? So I think Father turned out, I, I, he said, I think the Air Force also needs some good young men. <laughs> <laughs> I Absolutely, sir. So, you know, I had the same pressure on me when I went to the academy, to the officer's training academy. Mm -hmm. I I was opting for the special forces for the para commandos. I was highly. So motivated. you said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then my battalion <laughs> commander, Colonel B.B. Sagar, was a gunner. He from the artillery regiment of artillery. So he tried to put some sense into my head. He said, "See, join the artillery, and uh, from artillery you can opt out for special forces. But from special forces, if you do not clear the probation, you cannot come back to artillery." And that is how I ended up joining the artillery. Yeah. So, right, so, right, yeah, which is quite recognizable. So, yeah. So, so tell me one thing: rising up to the rank of an air marshal in the air force—that's the second highest ranking officer of the country. I mean, how was it? Now you had you. I I wonder if you had heard these theories that so and so's senior officers' sons or very successful fathers' children normally do not break the mold; they remain in that. I don't know if you had heard those. That those that I. Know of many cases, sir, like you know, Karan Thapad, one of them, his father, General Thapad, was a chief, but then Karan Thapad has his own entity, he's there as uh, so. How is the feeling, sir? I'll give you another example of uh, now group captain, that time wing commander Abhinandan Vartaman on 27th February 2019 when he crashed landed into Pakistan and he was taken for a prisoner, prisoner of war for about 60 hours and he was awarded the Veer Chakra. In fact, his father. Incidentally, also an air marshal, air marshal Vartaman. I spoke to him a few days back, sir. I have been in touch with him. And I told him that, sir, how do you feel? Tell me that. Earlier, 
group captain Amit Anand was known as an air marshal son. Now that air marshal is known as group captain Abhinandan's father. Okay. So I'm sure well, it must be a great yeah. feeling. Well, that that, that uh, fortunately ne never happened in, in my case. I was <clears throat> not known as. I mean, I, I accepted I was General Karyapa son, field marshal. Father became field marshal in 1985. <clears throat> he was invested with the rank and uh, uh, field marshal in, in April 19, yeah, April 1985. <clears throat> 1985, yes. But uh, no, I was sort of. Um, I was only known as Nanda Karyapa or uh, Marshal Karyapa. We were going up the ranks. And uh, at one time, I was uh, th uh, trading on, on thin ice because I was um, uh, unfairly uh, blamed for two major incidents that occurred in when I was commanding Gwalior. <clears throat> one was in May 1989, <clears throat> excuse me, when the hangar collapsed and damaging eight brand or nine brand new Mirage aircraft. I was on leave at the time. I'd been in command of the station for barely four months. I was summoned back and um, then uh, to see this horrendous state of these beautiful aircraft crushed under the hangar roof. A court of inquiry was held and uh, uh, both my predecessor, uh, uh, great and famous um, Marshal Keeler, and, and I were exonerated. Because you say, look, what did they have to do with it? What did they have to do with the structure of the uh, hangar? When it eventually it turned out to be an MES or whomsoever was responsible for that construction. <clears throat> that same year, there was another horrendous e event. And that was when uh, then uh, the CEO of Seven Squadron, uh, Joe Bakshi, flying a Mirage, went into the ground on Air Force Day, 8th of October, 1989. Uh, and again, uh, he was based in my, on my station. And six weeks before the event, he was moved to Ambala, from where he carried out his practices and rehearsals under the supervision of Western Air Command. Unfortunately, on, on this fateful day, whatever happened, he went <coughs> to the ground. And as a re result, so, I mean, it was held against me. And how could this be permitted to happen? So in, in, in the event, oh, you know, Major, can we take a call? I'm supposed to be going off somewhere. Uh, no. I understand, sir. I understand. Sir, it was I wonderful being in conversation with you, sir. It was. Sorry? And thank you very much, sir. Before I let you go, I'd like to ask you, sir, which breed is your dog, sir? Sorry? Which breed is oh, your I, dog, I sir? Have a lab, I have a Labrador who's a cross between a Dachshund, a Labrador and a Doberman. And I have a Dachshund who's, I think, a cross between uh, a, a Rottweiler and a Dachshund. How sweet is that, sir? Our dog also is a Labrador. In fact, we have a Labrador. We have a Labrador and a cat. Both, okay. both no, coexist. I, I mean, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your um, Labrador's name? Casper, sir. Gas oh, my, my Labrador is, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bagheera. From sir, sir. sir. Okay, bye for now. We'll talk sir, again. It was wonderful being in conversation with you, sir. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Really. Bye. God bless. Bye, sir. Take care. Bye, sir. Dead, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.